Hi to everybody. I'm Meg Groling, and uh, I'm going to talk about my first book written for Savas Beatty, The Aftermath of Battle, The Burial of the Civil War Dead. And I'm happy to be with you. And uh, this book has been very successful for Savas Beatty. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I think it's successful is that it's designed so well. Chris Mikowski from Emerging Civil War and I worked on it uh, together because the, the truth is the aftermath of any battle is about the same as any other battle. You know, bang, bang, you're dead, you rot, you get buried, they dig you up 100 years later. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of you know, rinse and repeat. But um, Chris and I decided that we should really look at the uh, other things that that came as an aftermath of battle. And uh, I think you'll be surprised at what we found. The Emerging Civil War series, which this is a, a member of, was designed by Savas Beatty to be a price point book, sold at battlefields and in gift shops. But uh, like I say, Chris and I turned it, I think, into much more. Most Emerging Civil War titles deal with one subject, a battle, or even one day of a battle, or even one part of a day of a battle. Aftermath is different in that it deals with one subject, but that subject is looked at from many different positions. Most of the people who make up emerging civil war are or have been park rangers, battlefield guides, or volunteers at civil war sites at one point. And they all agree that the universal question asked by those who visit such places is, what did they do with all the bodies? Aftermath attempts to answer that question and then to turn and pose several more. The book was designed chronologically from the first officer death to the death of the last surviving Civil War veteran. Not every battle is a topic of discussion because many of them, as I said, would simply tell the same stories of pain, anguish, and death over and over again. We looked for points where specifically different things took place, things that were perhaps little known or which had a mystery until science helped evolve, science evolved to help solve the problems. Injury and illness were responsible for most of the suffering in the Civil War. Approximately three times as many soldiers died from illness as died from wounds, many in camp instead of in battle. And one of the greatest legacies of the Civil War is how soldiers are treated after being wounded in action. Dr. Jonathan Letterman was General George McClellan's medical director from July 1862 to December 1863. His plan for battlefield triage, how the wounded were identified, transported, and treated from where they were wounded to small field hospitals and then onto larger military hospitals is used with very few changes even today. Emergency and battlefield evacuation plans, an established chain of care, and the results saving lives are all based on Dr. Letterman's insightful understanding of what is due a common soldier when he signs up to die for his country. Horses and mules died by the thousands, hundreds of thousands. Unwitting casualties of battle, taps was played over human remains for the first time during the Civil War. Photojournalism, we're all familiar with that now, but it began with Matthew Brady. Embalming and the safe transport of remains began with the Civil War as well. The problem of what to do with all the bodies spawned the National Cemetery Movement, giving us Arlington as well as Andersonville. And finally, the last veterans died. The number of 620,000 casualties lasted for over 100 years until a college professor decided to think outside the box. And this began a recounting of the Civil War dead. Currently, we're at 750,000 and rising. The first to fall was Colonel Elmer Ellsworth. He was killed. He's a, a Union um, officer of a volunteer militia from New York. He died on May 24th, 1861, not in a battle uh, or a skirmish, but uh, in an attempt to um, uh, reconnoiter the Marshall House Hotel and remove a Confederate flag. He uh, was Colonel of the 11th New York Fire Zouaves, although prior to that, he led the Famous U.S. Zouab cadets, um, which uh, toured all over the, the Northeast. 
and um, when he um, got the New York Volunteer Fire Department to uh, come to war for him, uh, they came to Washington, and the, one of the first things they had to do was um, to get military occupation of Alexandria. As you know, um, Alexandria is right across from Washington, the, the capital. And uh, Lincoln had approached the city fathers of Alexandria and proposed to them the idea that they should be under martial law. Martial law uh, was important and uh, martial law comes with a quid pro quo for, for both parties. And um, Lincoln agreed not to fire on Alexandria. He agreed that uh, no army would be stationed in Alexandria and that hospitals would be open to both the North and the South uh, in Alexandria and all would be welcomed and cared for in exchange for the fact that um, uh, they agree that they, in turn, would not be used as a, a firing point for uh, an attack on Washington, D.C. And uh, the night of May 24th uh, was the, the night that uh, Ellsworth and a lot of other um, soldiers came across the Potomac to take military occupation of Alexandria. And uh, they pulled up at the wharf and got off the boats. And uh, the Marshall House Hotel, which isn't far from the wharf, had been flying a hotel flag for uh, a long time. And uh, Lincoln could see this flag. It was a version of the Stars and Bars from his office if he used a telescope. James Jackson was a well-known, uh, uh, hot, hot-tempered uh, secessionist. He was the proprietor of the Marshall House Hotel. And uh, Elmer Ellsworth was a very good friend of Abraham Lincoln. As the Zouaves marched past the, the Marshall House, he looked up and saw the flag. And it is said that he said that, flag, boys, we must have that flag. And uh, several of them entered the Marshall House. Ellsworth was killed on the uh, uh, first landing of the Marshall House by James Jackson. And uh, the man right in front of Ellsworth, Ellsworth is this gentleman here holding the flag in his hand. Um, and it was a huge flag, by the way. And this is um, uh, Frank Brownell, who is one of uh, the fire zouaves, who, as soon as he realized that his colonel was in danger, turned around and um, aimed his gun at James Jackson. Within seconds, there were two dead men in the the lobby of the Marshall House Hotel, and uh, as the first to fall, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth received national mourning in the North. Uh, it began in Washington. Uh, he was in the, the green room, uh, and uh, his funeral was there, and then he went by train to New York City and uh, lay in state at the Astor House, as well as the state capitol. Uh, the, in New York. Um, he then went up the Hudson to Mechanicville, where he was from, and uh, was buried in the Hudson View Cemetery there. It was truly a national celebration of mourning. Little did they know what was coming. At this point, of course, the Civil War was, uh, I mean, Sumter hadn't, had just barely been fired on. Nobody knew it would last for another four years. Major Sullivan Ballou had a terrible aftermath of war, aftermath of battle. He's best known through Ken Burns as writing a romantic Dear Sarah letter to his wife. And uh, I think that qualifies him as the most romantic man in the Union Army, although he only, he died at the Battle of First Bull Run. Yeah, Sullivan Ballou was a self-made man, a lawyer, and a politician in, in Rhode Island. And he uh, put together troops uh, for the second Rhode Island, uh, uh, volunteer militia, and he led those troops at first bull run. And the morning of the fighting, he uh, was injured at a fence near the Stone House. He, he died eight days after the battle on July 29th, 1861. Um, also hit at that same time was um, Colonel John Slocum, and he died a few days earlier. Uh, the reason that these two men are kind of intertwined is that both of them were taken to uh, a hospital kind of on the grounds there 
and uh, in on set in Sedley Church, and uh, were cared for, although both perished. Um, the problem came as to how their bodies were going to be disposed of. Um, Colonel John Slocum outranked Major Sullivan Ballou, but at the time he died, there were not enough coffins that were, uh, I guess you would say, sufficient quality to house a, a colonel. There were only um, some, you know, pine toe pinchers, and uh, they didn't want to have to deal with more dead bodies. So unfortunately, Colonel John Slocum was in, interred in a, um, a pine box. So by the time Sullivan Ballou died, however, there are more coffins had come in and Sullivan Ballou got a more quality coffin. So um, even though he did not rank Colonel John Slocum. So this is a problem because they're buried on the grounds of the, the battlefield. And then the fight's over. The uh, Confederate Army is in charge of the battlefield after the Union Army ingloriously returns to Washington. And um, a little later in the year, in November, Governor Sprague, um, uh, Governor of Rhode Island, well, William Sprague, decided that he would come with um, troops and try to uh, find the, the coffins of the fellows who had defended Rhode Island's rights so bravely and returned them to their state. Um, and uh, they found... Well, when they got there to the area around the um, creek, they found what really surprised them. They found that the remains had not been uh, left alone, but had in fact been mutilated. They found uh, Sullivan Ballou's remains near the creek. Uh, and they found shirts and blanket and a skeleton, but there was no head and only one leg. They were able to identify it as Baloo because Baloo had had a leg amputated after the battle. So these guys have been lying there from July to March and uh, were actually dug up by the 21st Georgia. 21st Georgia wasn't even in the battle. They were just stationed there to watch the battlefield. And um, they were a new group in the Confederate Army. And just as... Um, true is as, as true today as it ever has been if a unit has poor leadership no mission and little unit cohesion you're going to have behavior problems and uh, the 21st georgia had poor leadership little unit cohesion and no mission so unfortunately the um 21st georgia mutilated the remains of some of the the corpses they found and the reason Sullivan Ballou's head was cut off, it is, well, pretty well known because it's been found in letters. Um, they thought that Sullivan Ballou was actually Colonel John Slocum because Ballou's coffin was better. His head was cut off and uh, his skull was sent back home so that they could um, you know, drink victory cocktails out of it. So um, when William Sprague and his group came to uh, the battlefield. Unfortunately, all they found were messed up remains and um, Ballou and Slocum were returned to Rhode Island, buried on March 31st, 1862. And uh, now Sullivan Ballou rests with his uh, beloved Sarah next to him in Swan Point Cemetery, Providence, Rhode Island. Shiloh was the next big battle. And a battle is uh, considered to be won when one army leaves the field to its opponents. The problem with this is that the winning army then has to clean up the battlefield, which is a difficult and unpleasant job. The Battle of Shiloh took place on April 6th and 7th, 1862. So the dead and injured were left on the battlefield overnight in driving rain. And it was a nightmare for all concerned. Uh, many letters and uh, Things in the records say, talk about the feral pigs that could be heard all over the field, munching away on dead men and probably on those not quite so dead. And the nightlong bombardment from Grant's artillery 
stationed at the river area, um, plus lightning and thunder sent flashes of light and loud explosive noises across this field of misery. You can imagine how horrifying it was. But throughout the night, a phenomenon was noticed. Many soldiers who were wounded had a mysterious blue-green glow that emanated from their open wounds. This was noted, and it was also realized that the men whose wounds had glowed brightest had the highest recovery rate. This phenomenon began to be referred to as angel's glow, and it quickly became part of the mythology of the Civil War. Shiloh was not the only battlefield where this was observed. But what exactly angel's glow was was not discovered until 2001, and that was when the mystery was solved. Sure, um, many of you listening have kids and grandkids who have participated in the uh, science fair, and uh, Angel's Glow actually became the subject of a science fair project. It was solved by two high school students who were uh, Civil War buffs, as well as scientists. 17-year-old Bill Martin was visiting Shiloh with his family, and he heard in the stories about the strange glow. His mother was a microbiologist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service, and she, in her past, had studied luminescent bacteria. Martin wondered if similar bacteria might have been at work in the uh, injuries of the soldiers at Shiloh. And he and his friend John Curtis um, researched a particular uh, a, a luminescent bacteria called Photorhabdus luminescence. It's a type of bacteria that lives in the guts of um, parasitic nematodes. It's pretty obscure, I understand. So anyway, um, Bill and, and John uh, researched photorhabdus luminescence. And when nematodes vomit up the glowing bacteria, uh, photorhabdus luminescence kills the other microbes living in the nematode's host. Normally, that bacteria couldn't live in the human body since it dies at human body temperature. But Martin and Curtis studied the historical records and the conditions in Shiloh and realized that the nighttime temperatures were low enough for the soldiers to develop hypothermia, yeah, that and pigs, um, allowing the bacteria to thrive in their bodies, killing off competing bacteria and perhaps saving the lives of their human hosts. And for solving this decades-old mystery, Curtis and Martin did win first place in the 21, 2001 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. So, yay for them. Legend has it that the bugle call, TAPS, was found by a Union Army captain. He heard a pitiful crying for water on the battlefield of what would become known as the Five Days Battle near Berkeley Plantation in Virginia. The captain took a lantern out to find the soldier. When he finally located the boy, he realized it was his own son who had fought for the Confederacy, he dragged his son back to camp, but the young man died later that night. As the distraught father searched his son's clothing, he found the notes to a bugle call written on a scrap of paper. Unable to arrange a proper burial for his son, he finally found a bugler who would sound those notes above the coffined remains of his child, and the rest, as they say, is history. Except none of this is true, of course. This was a vignette written for Ripley's Believe It or Not and televised in 1949. The true story is more interesting, in my opinion. Union General Dan Butterfield wrote bugle calls for his troops to distinguish the calls his men were to obey. So the Dan, 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 Butterfield, Butterfield uh, was blown before the calls uh, to his specific troops and that uh, his men knew all the calls and knew when they were being spoken to by the bugle. During the encampment of uh, the Army of the Potomac on the grounds of Berkeley Plantation on the Virginia Peninsula, General Butterfield decided to try out a new bugle call for lights out. Butterfield's bugler, Oliver Norton, practiced and finally debuted the call during the time of the five days battle. Within hours, the call had spread around the entire camp encamped army, and very soon it was picked up by Confederate buglers as well. Playing taps at a funeral dates from this time, as it's a much shorter piece than those previously used, and it only requires one musician, because 
After the five days battle, both time and music men were in short supply. Just three days after the Battle of Antietam, in mid-September of 1862, photographer Alexander Gardner, an assistant and a driver, were sent to Maryland to photograph the dead men left on the battlefield, most of whom are Confederate. Gardner worked for Matthew Brady, a very successful society photographer. Um, Brady gets a lot of um, uh, bad publicity, I think, um, simply because he was losing his eyesight. Prior to the war, Brady had maintained a studio and a gallery in New York City, but when the war broke out, he also opened a studio in Washington and was determined to photograph the events of the war, from parades and inaugurations to battlefield chaos. But Brady was losing his sight. He hired several men to do the actual photographic work after the Battle of First Bull Run. Uh, Brady himself had brought the Watson wagon and the plates and a, a helper and took pictures of the Battle of First Bull Run. But by the time they got back to Washington, he realized none of the plates he shot there were usable. But Alexander Gardner brought back over 70 plates from the battlefield at Antietam. Within two days, they were printed carefully wrapped and sent to the Brady Gallery in New York. And on October 20th, the show, the gallery show, which was called The Dead of Antietam, opened. And New York was stunned. They'd never seen anything like this. The uh, photographer, uh, re reviewer for the show, uh, wrote in the New York Times, it was as if the dead had been laid at our very doorsteps. And this was the first time uh, war had been seen in this way. And um, although we are very much used to photojournalists embedded with uh, armies now and, and, and seeing what happens, this was the first time it had ever been seen publicly. I think this is an amazing aftermath of battle. So Matthew Brady has on his glasses, of course. And uh, there's uh, Alexander Gardner. Horse. <laughs> um, now, the movie War Horse sparked an interest in uh, the four-legged victims of combat, at least it did for me. Most of the one and a half million horses and mules that died in the Civil War were simply piled up and burned, creating a terrible stench that fouled the, airs, fouled the air around the battlefield, like it wasn't bad enough already, fouled that air for miles. That's a very unfortunate aftermath. But a few War horses of famous men got their own aftermath. General Lee's traveler is buried with his master at Washington and Lee University. General Sheridan's Rienzi of poetic fame is stuffed and mounted in his own glass case at the Smithsonian. Old Baldy, General Meade's war horse, is in the GAR Museum in Philadelphia. I felt that no book on the Civil War dead would be complete without mentioning those who died while performing the duties they were asked to do. Pull cannons and wagons, carry their riders into harm's way. These animals didn't choose a side. They never owned a slave. They just followed orders and died. It's a famous Civil War photograph, Three Men, Three Legs. Um, a topic that is just as current today as it was in the 1860s is amputation. Um, when I was working on my master's degree, I found this to be uh, very interesting in the amount of amputations done now that had not been done basically since the Civil War. The decision to amputate is one that no doctor wants to make, but it's often the only way to save a life uh, is to remove that limb that has been damaged beyond repair. The nature of projectiles in the Civil War, specifically the mini ball and cannon shells, was that bone was mangled into small splintered pieces rather than breaking cleanly. Nor were bullets likely to pass through and out of a person's body. Instead, they ricocheted around inside the victim, doing incomparable damage. Amputation was used very frequently to save lives if possible. However, since the Civil War, the rate of amputation fell considerably due to changes in weaponry. Neither World War I or II, nor Korea, nor Vietnam used amputation similar to that used in the Civil War until the late 20, 21st century, 
when weaponry underwent another change. As military forces moved into areas where improvised explosive devices, IEDs, and handmade small bomb clusters were the weapons of choice, once again, bone splintering injuries began to appear. Both soldiers and civilians who have been living victims of incendiary devices have often had to endure amputation once again. Much has improved, of course. Operations are safer now, and palliative care is an art in itself. Prostheses have evolved from wooden legs and arms used only for social gatherings due to the pain and clumsiness of the devices to amazing technical, almost bionic appliances that help their wearer regain his or her place in society. Most of the battles in the Civil War were fought on Southern soil. For a man to contemplate his own mortality was awful enough, but to think of dying far from home and of his remains never being returned, well, in Victorian times, that was unthinkable. Embalming is a process by which the natural fluids in the body are replaced by a combination of chemicals, although there was no specific formula in use during the time of the war. Embalmers used everything from rubbing alcohol or whiskey to arsenic blends of several varieties. Like ghouls, the embalmers followed the armies. A soldier could pay in advance for his body to be embalmed, if possible, and sent home. If embalming was not possible, or even if it was, special coffins were developed to contain human remains without overwhelming the surroundings with the stench of decay. Things got so bad with the stench of decay that several railroads refused to carry coffins because of the smell. It had an unfortunate tendency to linger after the coffins had been removed. Finally, embalmers and coffin makers got better at their trades and remains were returned in double coffins, lead-lined coffins, and metal coffins that had been welded shut. Those whose bodies could not be embalmed and sent home were far more numerous, however, than the lucky few. Most dead bodies were buried where they lay, sort of. The army developed a policy of entrenching remains that went like this. Bodies were lined up side by side, in very shallow graves. The first to be buried was moved on top of the fellow next to him, and the hole underneath him was deepened. The body was then dumped into that hole, and the dirt from that hole was used to cover the next body, and so on down the line. Pieces of wood about two feet long and a foot wide were used to identify the corpse, if possible. If not, the boards often said, Yankee soldier, unknown soldier, Confederate soldier, Another way to bury soldiers, especially if they had been exposed to the elements for a longer time, was to dig a pit and fill it in with bodies. Both ways were fast, but not very effective. After the war, the national government made great efforts to find, disinter, and identify Union bodies. Rewards were offered for remains, and the Veteran Volunteer Corps traveled to every possible volunteer, excuse me, every possible battlefield, looking for graves and remains. Land was bought on or near the battlefields and bodies were laid to rest in military funerals. This process began the creation of what we now know as national cemeteries. From Arlington to Gettysburg, from Fredericksburg to Chattanooga, the chain of American cemeteries runs across the land honoring our war dead. The South had its own story there was resistance to burying blue and gray together in large cemeteries, so southern graveyards tended to be smaller and more intimate. And additionally, each southern state wanted to be responsible for its own troops. There was no push for a national organization encompassing a collection of Confederate soldiers. The one exception to this pattern is Hollywood Cemetery outside Richmond. It existed before the war, and its proximity to the Confederate capital made it an obvious resting place for Southern elite like President Davis and his family. Many Confederate officers are buried there, and many groups of unidentified remains are there as well. Hollywood's a beautiful example of a Victorian garden cemetery with winding paths and small private places for contemplation and prayer. No one grave is exactly like the other, but all fit and flow together, the aesthetically lovely and the absurd intertwined in death as perhaps never in life. By this point, we, uh, Chris and I realized that all we talked about were um, 
soldiers and we hadn't talked about um, any sailors at all. So uh, one of the most interesting things going on in the uh, in, in Civil War research right now is, um, excuse me, the Hunley, the little sub sort of stands in for all who were lost at sea or buried in watery graves. And the truly exciting part, my opinion, of the Hunley story is not exactly historical, but current. Facial reconstruction, just like on television shows like CSI, NCIS, Bones, has given the anthropologists who work on the skeletal remains the ability to put faces to the men who lost their lives. Amazingly, enough DNA is finding relatives of these sailors and giving them back their history and their lives. And um, I think the, what they're working on now is um, looking at the clothing they wore and reconstructing that clothing, um, basically fiber by fiber, and uh, attempting to find out just how it was that these men died since um you would think if something had happened they would all be rushing for the uh the conning tower to get out of the um, submarine but every single one of the men who powered the submarine just simply died at his station they think perhaps it was a, a an implosion that killed them right where they they sat you can't get out of the aftermath of battle without andersonville one of the final chapters in our book is the story of the recovery of prisoner bodies at Andersonville, Georgia's notorious Confederate prison. Clara Barton, mostly known as a nurse in the Civil War, was actually not a nurse at all. She was a one-woman sanitary commission. She worked out of Washington, D.C., and uh, took up collections for the soldiers. She arrived with wagons, filled with supplies for her soldiers around the battlefields in the Washington area and was headquartered in the city of Washington where she ran the missing soldiers office from her small apartment above a store on 7th Street. If you go there now, it's a very active historically interpreted site and uh, the, the site also of some fabulous music gatherings and uh, spoken word readings. It's really a, a, an interesting place to, to go. But one day in the spring of 1865, a very tall man walked up the rickety steps to Miss Barton's abode. And this was Dorrance, Dorrance Atwater. He had been released from Andersonville only a few months earlier, and he carried with him a list, a very important list. During his time at Andersonville, he had volunteered to work in the dead house, identifying men who died at Andersonville and preparing them for burial. Lists of the dead were kept by the Confederates, but Atwater was not sure he could trust that the lists would ever be given to the Union authorities so that bodies of An of the bodies of Andersonville could be properly identified. So, Dorrance Atwater copied the lists and kept his version with him until he was released. Initially, he tried to enter the government, interest the government with his information, but at that time, President Johnson had his hands full with Reconstruction and Atwater was rebuffed. He finally decided to take his list to Miss Barton. Best decision ever. Due to the efforts of the very tall Mr. Dorrance Atwater and the very small Miss Clara Barton, a government commission was sent to Andersonville. The shock at what they found reverberated throughout the entire North. A lot happened after that, but what finally came to Atwater's and Barton's efforts was that the jumbled remains of Union men were sorted identified if possible, and reburied with care, love, and dignity. The Andersonville National Cemetery and the Andersonville National Historic Park would never have come into existence without the joint efforts of Clara Barton and Doris At Dorrance Atwater. This is one of the cemeteries who, uh, I, I don't know if it's actually finished yet, but they um, uh, had the uh, opening ceremonies for it not too long ago. So the aftermath of battle finally becomes the aftermath of war. Veterans went back to their lives and tried to go forward, some more successful than others. Organizations such as the United Confederate Veterans and the Grand Army of the Republic provided some focus for the men, spawned support groups for sons and daughters of the veterans. But time refused to stand still each year, there were fewer and fewer men in attendance at memorial events, and old men got older. By August 1856, 
Former Union Private Albert Woodson was the last man standing. He was 109. In October of 1864, when he was 17, he had enlisted in Company C, 1st Minnesota Volunteer Heavy Artillery. He and his drum and his bugle served with the Army of the Tennessee under Major General George Thomas. He spent most of the summer of 1856 in St. Luke's Hospital in Duluth, Minnesota, with a recurring lung condition, passing away in the company of his loved ones on August 2nd. At his funeral, thousands turned out to honor the old soldier. At his funeral, then-President Dwight Eisenhower wrote the obituary for the New York Times, mentioning that Albert Wilson was the last link that we, as Americans, had to both sides of the war between the states. Interest in the Civil War does not appear to be slowing down. More books are published annually about the war than about any other conflict. These publications help remind us that those who fought deserve to be remembered. Confederate or Union, officer or enlisted, identified or still unknown. This is what we do with all the bodies. We read about them and we remember their stories and their sacrifices. We remember they were ordinary people, just like us, trying their best to do their duty under extraordinary circumstances. They all look toward home and we welcome them back to rest in peace. Thank you.